It's like that first day of class when like, you know, all the students sit in the very back corner. So we're kind of like that. We don't fight, but we're nice, we're friendly people. So come on in. Feel. Feel free to fill the room. And there's people that come in late, right, that always end up in the front row reluctantly. Hey, do you feel comfortable there? Do you feel like we're gonna, you know? Oh, anybody have a chair to close? Yeah, you want to sit right there? There's one. There's a there's a chair yeah. over there. Yeah, come on in. Make yourself at home. I see there's space too. So, um, since this is the very beginning of the semester, I was just kind of getting a sense of who's here and all that. I would love to get kind of a sense of who's here for the first time. Director, student senate. Perfect. So glad to meet you guys. Welcome. We're glad to have you. Um, I am the president, Lori Jacobs, and um, very simple. We just kind of walk through and follow our agenda, discuss any issues. When we get to the old and new business, please, please, please feel free to bring up anything that we haven't discussed already. And in the interim, you're absolutely welcome to ask any questions, interrupt, interject, whatever. This is not a presentation, it's a conversation. Okay? So feel free to join in whenever you feel the mood strikes. So I had two big things that I want to talk about. Um, one of them is the president's meeting, and it, the actual title of that was a conversation with the president, and it was um, essentially an event where President Spaniolo gathered uh, various members of the administration, um, department heads, key people, unions, et cetera, and then also presidents of certain organizations, several organizations, myself, and um, Jennifer Fox, President included. Um, but anyway, and we attended. We had lunch in Jenny. And the, how do I put it? It was mostly a rah rah rah, UT is awesome presentation from the president, kind of updating us on you know, what has happened, what progress we've made, what we can expect for our future progress of the year. And there were a lot of really interesting things. Um, there were also some moments that I wasn't as happy with, so I will kind of just I want to just kind of report some of the things. For your reference, if you haven't yet, you should totally go to MapWorks and log in and register as a member of Graduate Student Senate. And if you do, Bill, would you mind doing over there again? You will go, be able to have access to a documents page in which you can see um, any documents that we put up there for members only. Okay. And so one of them is my response. And I called it sort of an editorial response to the president. And um, I tried posting it as news, but apparently you know, the character went on until too late. So we read that and continued it. But essentially, what happened is that the, as it's become fairly typical around here, the president made many suggestions about things that we could to continue our progress and improvement toward as a university and move towards that tier one goal. Um, however, I felt that there were some holes in sort of the plan. As an example, uh, when we had an opportunity to ask questions, I asked for the president to offer more specifics about how this, his plans for the future would directly relate to and involve graduates. <laughs> And now this is my personal opinion, and I could be completely wrong about this, but it appeared to me as if he had no answer for that. It appeared to me as if there was a dodge to the question. Um, he referred directly to the uh, Chancellor Cigarro's framework a new number of times in his formal presentation, and then again in response to my question. Uh, I provided the link on the um, on the news part of the fabrics there, so if you want to go and check it out, I definitely encourage you to. But the reason that it concerned me slightly that our president did not have more of a direct awareness and understanding and plan and able to order to answer my question is that the framework itself addresses quite directly several ways in which graduate students are a part of the larger picture, right? For example, in House Bill 51, which some of you may know is the guiding force for our Tier 1 drive, it's the thing that makes it possible for, or funds this whole Tier 1 race, right? And it, in that, outlines several key things that would make an institution a 
a tier one university. Two of the bullet points directly relate to graduate students, and we're talking out of six here, so that's a third. <laughs> Right? And then two others are graduate student related in a less direct way, such as overall research um, endeavors, which we all know that we do, all the, we do all the actual work of the research at the university, right? So that's pretty much 90% of our work we do. Um, and another is like excellence in, in academics, right? Which relates to us on a number of levels, and obviously as students, and then those of us who teach as teachers, right? So in short, this. The Chancellor's Framework, Cuswell 51, and the uh, whole drive for becoming Tier 1 is immensely involves graduate students, right? And what we should be seeing more of, and we don't, is direct conversations with graduate students with from administration. And so what I basically wrote in my editorial was that I would love to have a conversation directly about um, ways that we can do that. Um, for example, it seems to me that if we want to, the, the chancellor made a direct call in this framework for um, the raising, basically uh, changing the financial picture by you know, raising money and reducing costs. And you know, my opinion, we have an excellent resource here, right here, with graduate students, as people who are able to approach things from a fresh perspective, look at things at the cutting edge. And I think we should be involved more directly with the actual work of a GP resource. I say it much better in writing, so <laughs> I suggest you read it. Um, <laughs> but anyway, um, since then, in fact, almost immediately after the meeting, I got an email from Dean Cohen saying that he would be happy, which was weird because I was like, I think you know that I know that we've talked about this stuff already, but okay, whatever. So he emailed me and said that he would, would love to come and talk to us directly about some of the things that we would like to see and also to brief us on some of the plans that they already have in motion. Uh, some of the stuff will be old news. I would imagine, for example, that the enhanced GTA program is a significant portion of that and we have talked about that already endlessly. Um, oh, I know, I know, I don't mean that. I just mean that it won't necessarily be new stuff that we'll be hearing about entirely. But it would be awesome, I think, to have the dean in the room with us so we could ask him some direct questions and you guys could, you know, tell him directly what your concerns are and whatever else, right? So he has tentatively agreed to come and visit us on October 20th and our regular meeting. And once I have that locked in, I will make sure that we are all well aware of the date and so that we can have, I would love to have a packed house for that day. So do we call that the day's forum? Right. And, and post it as that. Wait, say one more time? Post it as the Dean's Forum. So you open it up and say this is the Dean's Forum. Anything goes. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Perfect. Check with him, though, because sometimes he likes questions beforehand. Just I'm glad you said that, because that's the next we'll one point on my list, which is I would like to, in the meantime, have a forum of our own going where we can kind of uh, talk about some issues, post question, possible questions that we'd like to ask, things that we would like him to address specifically. Um, I also think that we should make sure that we read beforehand the Chancellor's Framework so that we know specifically what it is that um, the quote-unquote goals of the university are. I also suggest that you read the President, Mr. President's Manuolo's kind of recent, there have been several things that come across an email about plans for the university for the coming year and things like that. So kind of having at least a working understanding of those things would be handy. We're talking short documents here, so I don't feel as if I'm telling you to read a seminar paper or something. I'm not. It's up to two pages. So, and you can scan it and get the gist. But anyway, so we will put on, I'm pretty sure there's one already. Isn't there already a way that we can have conversations on networks? They can post on the homepage. Okay, yeah. So we can just post, we can just post on the homepage any of our issues and, or any questions that you want us to ask. Or Facebook. Or Facebook. Is that a great Place, and we'll make sure that we can, oh, you know, that way you guys can talk about them, and we can also make sure we collect them before the need comes as well. Know what we want to talk about. Sound reasonable? So I'm kind of excited about the fact that we've done this. And um, so that was that. Any questions about the president's conversations, presentation, video? Have you been doing this before? Uh, I've been
and similar things. Yeah, it's not legislative. I'm pretty sure. I mean, I guess I didn't take a head count or anything, but I think I was in. I would also say President Trump case was this coming Monday. Oh yeah. So okay. Oh okay. yeah. Well, so if anyone has anything that they would like you to take to him, oh good questions. Thank you. Thank you. I will go to President Trump table on Monday. Um, this is a gathering of all the organizations on campus, and the president and um, sometimes the other administrative folks are there. So if you have questions that you'd like me to ask directly, please feel free to send them to me. Um, the actual discussion part is often more limited at that, though, so I will say that I will probably only get an opportunity to ask a couple of questions. So if they're, I will be looking for major themes for those of you who post. Thanks for that. But yeah, any or all of the above. And as always, I'm sure you guys can have learned to count on me to be a thorn in everybody's side whenever I have the opportunity to do so, so I will make sure to bring up my own set of issues too. Other questions about President? One more time. Time and place for the rounding. It's at five. It's um. It's at five forty-five on Monday. So if you have questions, is it open today, or is it just invitation? I think it's it's invite only. Yeah, it's yeah. invite only. So only you can attend, but you can certainly send me some questions. And you're going to, aren't you? No, this is not this one. You're going? Oh yeah. I'm trying to remember, we, we worked out a schedule, but I remember it was done. So Mariana and I will both go. So you feel free to email us directly if it's something you don't want to post, or to the listserv, or to anywhere. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. Anything else about? Cool. Okay. So let me. I will briefly. Uh, next thing on my list is the Constitution. Um, those of you who are new, this will be new information, but I will summarize that last year we discovered a flaw for lack of a better word in the constitutions that basically gives the student congress veto power over us okay and upon further investigation decided or discovered that other universities have different focus systems of representation and that it would align with the university's goals towards tier one status overall if we had a more <coughs> up-to-date version of representation so, I prepared a report of a summer for Dean Cohen, and he read it, and he dug it, <laughs> and he said, he gave us his blessing and said, go forth, young ones, and proceed. So, uh, working on that, and I've been basically meeting one-on-one -on -one with the student congress president, Jennifer Fox, and discussing the things that we want to change and how we might change them. It's, Things to consider here is that we're talking, and this is going to be a mega monster long process because we're essentially suggesting that we would have to make changes to, a cost, to constitutions of both organizations, which requires voting, or requires president administrative approval, or requires board of region approval, blah, 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 blah. It requires a lot. And then, even assuming that we were successful with that in a relatively short period of time, we would then have to consider any structural changes that would have to take place as a consequence, such as Say, for example, we change how uh, graduate students are represented within student congress, well then we have to figure out well, how we're going to elect them, and then when do we elect them, and how many, and all that. You follow me? Mm -hmm. So, I met with Jennifer Fox actually today for a really long period of time, um, and we basically hashed out kind of undergraduate concerns and versus our concerns about what we think could and should and might. And where we are now is that we plan to meet with our executive committee and their executive committee in two weeks and basically start talking about well, what might this look like if we make any changes, what, what might we change, you know, how would this impact the student body as a whole, including undergrads and graduate students. So that's where we are. We're at the very, 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 Okay, but if you are interested, I did finally remember to upload the said report that I wrote for the dean, and it is on um, MadWorks under documents. There you go. The sorry, this is the right setup. B 
the, the report itself is called the Graduate Student Internal Rules Committee, uh, Graduate Student Representation, see more, Representation Report to the Dean of the Graduate School. Okay, and this is where the actual argument and the, the issues of the Constitution are articulated, so that you can see for yourself what the situation is. And then there's a little supplement, which is a nice handy little chart. Um, in order to make the date, the report for the dean, I basically looked at, a, well not just me, several of us looked at other universities and figured out what, what do their structures look like, compared to the population numbers, and so on and so forth. So you can also see that. Um, and, well, the quickest way to sum up this chart is that we are way behind on making some changes. So, and the, um, Questions about? Oh, I remember. We're going to also talk. Jennifer and well, I both agreed that we wanted to actually talk to a lot of other organizations as well. So one of the things we're going to work on in the next two weeks is making some phone calls and talking to the presidents of other graduate student senates and other student congresses and finding out well, how does your system work? Do you feel like it represents everybody fairly equally? Yada yada yada. So that's one of the things we're going to do. Any questions about any of that? Pages. And then, like you see sometimes on talk shows where they will relay the questions as they come. 
them up or ask questions of everybody that's on the chat. So like a moderator. Kind of Thank you. That's an excellent word. <laughs> yes, precisely. I like that word too. <laughs> so yeah, we would love somebody who would like would be willing. Basically, a one requirement would be that you have to be able to attend the meetings. So and or find somebody who could come in your stead if you could. But that would be the only. And then, of course, I guess it would be nice if it actually were internet slash social media savvy enough to be able to perform said function quickly. Okay, well, think about it. If you're interested, <laughs> let us know. Is it the Brian? Is it the Brian? Yeah, we'll start it up there. Um, the other thing that I wanted to discuss this meeting is I attended the Graduate Retention Advisory Board meeting. And uh, there were a few things of interest to you that I thought were important to relay. Um, the first thing that came up that really interested me, and I think it will you too, is that they were discussing the EGTA uh, positions and the funding that goes with that. Because this is a new program, nobody really knew exactly how it would work or how it should be structured when they started it and so there were some holes and they're starting to work those out or I guess they have actually worked those out and it's finalized. Um, for those of you that have an EGTA or that could potentially have, I'm sorry, enhanced uh, graduate teaching assistant, um, basically there's a move because of the push to tier one status, there's a move within the university to give more funding with this EGTA position to incoming doctoral students, and they're using it as a recruiting tool. And the way that it's structured, only incoming, uh, new incoming doctoral students are eligible for this funding package, and um, or they also have included all but dissertation students. So that if there is a spot available within your college or your program, then all but just an all but dissertation student could potentially fill that spot. What I learned in this meeting was that although the funding is guaranteed for up to five years, that's the way that they offer it, there is a small stipulation in that offer letter, which they may or may not have pointed out to you, um, that they reserve the right to provide that funding in any way that they see fit, that, which means that after the first year, they have the ability to remove you from the EGTA position and drop you down to uh, a GRA position, and they're only required to continue funding up to 75% of what you were being paid before. Um, there are some programs in the university that have additional funding available to cover the difference, some don't. So if you have an EGTA position or if it's something that you might be interested in the future, I highly suggest that you discuss that with your particular department, with your college, to see what kind of arrangements they have in place to cover that funding and whether they intend to actually drop people out of the EGTA at, at any point during those five years. Because like I said before, it's meant to be a recruiting tool to bring in new PhD students. And so they only have a certain number of slots available, and that's why they have this option to move you out of that position to give it to somebody else. Doesn't that sound kind of like a bait and switch kind of thing? To recruit somebody <laughs> at, at like this EGTA level and then drop them down? I mean, it seems like there should be some guarantee that it's like, okay, as long as you're a student, you'll continue to receive that level of funding, not... You could look at it that way. I choose not to look at it that way. <laughs> Simply because they're having as hard a time with this as we are. And they're trying, I think, to make an honest effort to work with us to, in any way that they can to fill the gap. I mean, we went through this, that you know, the students who were already here when they started the EGTA, there were a lot of people who weren't happy about, you know, oh, new people are going to get more money than you. Well, and there are but, limitations. But, but it, seems, it seems almost worse to say, oh, new people are going to get more money than you. 
but then we might switch them back. Well, there's limitations for, and just to make sure that everybody's clear, it's not as if it's, at least it's not intended to be a random haphazard. Because I was actually a participant in a lot of these conversations last year, so I can tell you that it is certainly not the graduate school's intent for that to be any sort of bait and switch. Um, but what has happened is that it's intended to be a recruitment tool for a certain caliber quality of student, and it is conditional upon that student actually living up to those expectations. So what has happened is if students do not no longer meet their department's guidelines for the EGTA position, then it can be taken away, okay? And then one of the problems they addressed last year is, well, then what do you do with it? And due to my, uh, at least I would like to believe that I helped a lot because I said a lot of times out loud in Dean's presence and that maybe it's why he decided to go with it. But I suggested that it should also be an opportunity for, um, there should be more opportunities for existing students to have access to some of this. And so there is also a now an allowance for all ABD students to get those funds should they become available after somebody else leaves. It right. sounds like the, the availability of the funds is kind of a little bit iffy that you might get one year and you know lose it the next year and it's supposed to be and then and there's one more thing I wanted to add that I do want to add to that. One of the things that graduate school is working on is standardizing those rules and they have a three year plan for how those standards will be implemented. So um, one of them is let me start there. So like starting this was the first year for example that it's a minimum if I want to it's a minimum like GPA requirement and things like that. Next year it'll be a slightly higher one, and then the year will be a slightly higher one, and so on and so forth. And in addition, they have been previously, um, what's the word, relying on departments to volunteer their standards and publish them. This year they are required to publish them. So I would imagine though that not everybody's actually done that yet, because we all know how people departments actually work, but. It's, they are supposed to have that posted this year. So, so it, it will be, it should operate like any other funding would or any other scholarship would. Which is that <coughs> it's conditional upon you actually meeting the requirements of the reason you're being funded. But does it, does it go the other way that if you meet those requirements, you're guaranteed to stay? Yes. No. Well, it's supposed to. And well, and it be no. <laughs> no. The answer is no. Now, now the answer is that's, yes. that's what they were saying. Yeah. That's, yeah. That's, that's the part that concerns me is that. You know, someone new comes here saying, oh, I'm going to be making this much money. This is a much better deal than this other institution that I'm considering. And then after two years, they tell them, oh, you're only going to get 75% of that. It, it is concerning, and that's why I encourage you to talk to your college specifically, because the colleges are the ones that ultimately make the decisions on how to meet those funding requirements. Now, I will say that Okay, the graduate advisory board is where essentially the dean and, um, and, and the graduate schools I'm just attacking your okay. uh, the portals and finish the advisors and then take their questions and kind of basically talk to them so that they can be prepared to talk to their graduate students. Graduate assembly, which is a committee that I serve on, is where they make the um, recommendations for what rules should go into place. So, and I will be on that. I don't think it meets before our next meeting. I think it's we go October, if I remember correctly. I was looking at my calendar so I could try to remember the date. But anyway, I will bring this up then and clarify that. In my experience on that committee, though, I would say that it's certainly, I doubt very strongly that it's the graduate school's intent for that to be the case. And if and if there, if it's that, that way, is a loophole that, as Mariana kind of addressed already, it's something that they didn't foresee or they didn't think about putting in, and it's something that we can request that they can sooner rather as a contingency or as a stipulation. Right. Does that and, make sense? Yeah. Okay. And then the other question I had was just that, uh, so you, right. is it a policy now that if a student goes from the BGTA to a GRA, then they do drop down to the lower level? Because when this was all being started, that's, some people were saying that people who became G GRAs would stay at the same level. That's why I said that's dependent upon the your particular school and department on on whether or not they're able to fill that 25% gap or whatever percentage it is. Right, I mean, the way that your offer letter is written right now, it states that 
they can at any point drop you down and they're required to cover up to, or excuse me, at a minimum 75% of what you were previously um, getting as the EGTA. So there's no, so no for firm exam policy on There's not. For example, the College of Engineering, their, their policy that they decided upon was that in the event that, that they do uh, drop somebody down from an EGTA position, they have the STEM, uh, the STEM grant that they will use to fill that gap, that 25% gap. And as far as the, stu the student is concerned, they don't see any difference, except for their title. Um, on the other hand, colleges like the College of Liberal Arts don't necessarily have grants to make up that difference. So. I have, if anybody wants it, and I can scan it and put it up there so you can see it, I have the memo and of the, the, from the graduate school of what the guidelines spending balance is supposed to be and what departments are supposed to be doing. There's a, actually, um, Elisa is working on finalizing that document, mm -hmm. and it will go up online, and um, as soon as she has it up online, she will email that to me, which I will then put it up to you. Before the next meeting, before the next grad meeting, which is uh, scheduled for October 2nd, so sometime in the next couple of weeks, that should be finalized and up on their website, and I will push that link to you guys so that you can actually go through and read it. Um, and well, since it's relevant, and since it's relevant to the questions we want you guys to be able to ask the dean and emails, and are those discussions we want to have on Facebook, I'll go ahead and post the existing one. I'll scan it in and post it on. The documents page as well on AdWords. Okay, so you can look at it now and then you can see what the intent is, what the graduate assembly has recommended, what the policy standards be, and, and it also details the, what the changes will be over time. Because it's, it's, like I said, it's a, it's a tiered thing. It changes a little bit each year, both in funding amounts and also in tools. There are minimum requirements that you have to be to stay eligible. Right. So yeah. as, it, as it stands now, um, the only way existing students will get teaching experience is if an opportunity comes up in the middle of the year. Oh, yeah. you, they still have regular GTAs. And stuff. That also depends on a particular school. Yeah. Yeah. Well, my the reason I ask is because my school doesn't have don't have that um, two position for GTAs. And there's just never one available for existing students. It's always for incoming students. Those. I mean, those are questions that. It, we would love for you to push to us and then also to bring up to Dean Cohen. Um, that is an excellent question. And I, I would imagine that that is, that there, one, and that I meant to say this earlier in response to Robert's question, is that the, uh, some of the holes that we're seeing are because the graduate school didn't want to impose uh, too many limitations on the departments. They wanted to let the departments be able to structure things the way that made sense for them. So, Part of what some of us are seeing are the fact that some departments only have two graduate students. And some, like English, how many do we have? Do we have any idea how many GTAs we have? A lot. A lot. We have a lot. We have a lot of GTAs. So some have some and some have tons, right? So they, and they also are supposed to be getting a percent, an appropriate percentage of that pool of money based on how many they have. Uh, what about a student with a regular GTA decides to change, switch departments in the same college? So does that existing student with a regular GTA is going to the new department, does he or she become eligible for no. his GTA? Uh, is still so. considered within the same school? Uh, I mean, I suppose maybe, if, in fact, actually, I know you can if you were, if you were going from, say, master's to PhD. Yes. Okay. But within PhD? Yeah, then no. You can't move programs, and if you and it also works the other way. Whereas if you had one in the department you were leaving, the money would stay in that department. It would not go with you, the new department. That part I know for sure. Any other questions? Thank you for coming. Thank you. 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 It's a new funding opportunity, not really funding opportunity, it's a new resource opportunity for um, those of you that are teaching in STEM fields. Uh, it's called the CERTL Network, 
and it's a network of universities uh, around the nation. They just opened up this network to include 25 new universities, including us. And basically what it is is these are leading institutes in, um, I guess, pedagogy and teaching. Um, and they provide resources to students, current um, graduate students, on how best to teach undergraduate students in STEM areas. And the reason that this is applicable, I guess, to everybody is that um, regardless of whether whether you're in a STEM field or not as an undergrad, you're still required to take courses in those fields, whether, you know, science and math um, and other technology. And so it's, it's important for people teaching those classes to understand that the communication to those students can't only be geared toward students in those particular fields. You, you have to make it broad enough so that those from the humanities or um, the pure arts can also understand what's going on. What are you trying to say? I wouldn't understand it. I have a no, very like, scientific mind. Right, no, I completely agree. What I'm saying <laughs> is that we nerds <laughs> tend to use very technical <laughs> jargon and it doesn't always go across, right? Right, right, right. No, it's easy. <laughs> but um, those are resources that will be available to us. They're currently working on um, proposing courses from UTA uh, and working on getting us access to the resources from the existing schools. So that's something that should become available um, as soon as the spring semester, possibly not until <coughs> next fall, but things to look look for in the future. Um, last thing is that uh, there are two kind of uh, recruiting activities that the, grad, the Office of Graduate Studies are looking at right now. One is the um, LSAMP uh, Undergraduate Research Program. So again, if you're in STEM fields, uh, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, there's, uh, there's a program funded by the National Science Foundation in which undergraduate students um, participate in research, hands-on research, over the summer. And um, they work directly either with a professor or with a graduate student on a specific research project. If that's something that you might be interested in, in doing next summer as a mentor to a student or actually um, working directly on coming up with a project for them to do and um, guiding that research. Discuss it with your advising professor or your department um, and make sure that they're aware of your interest so that they can pass that along to the Office of Graduate Studies. They're actively recruiting right now for professors to participate in this coming summer program. The other thing that they do is that um, they go to professional conferences regularly. Um, I don't know, how many of you have ever been to a professional conference? So there's usually a career fair involved in those things in which um, employers and also graduate schools will be there to recruit. So if you're going to a, a conference uh, for a particular professional organization, um, they would like to know that so that they can either try and work, work with their recruiters and get your, your assistance in that, or if they don't have a recruiter going to that, then potentially getting new materials to be able to pass along while you're there. That's about it. Because Rebecca's gonna talk about breakfast. We had another meeting for breakfast earlier this week and we discussed uh, what we need to put the list on that board up and also on the agenda of how many students we need for each of those different areas and time. So more students during the day and then just a couple in the evening. And we're also still actively looking for people to be on the panel. Um, grad fest, well, grad fest is, for those of you who don't know, it's kind of a recruiting thing that UTA does. So it's our graduate school as well as other graduate schools from across the uh, country coming and talking to undergraduates about graduate study. So what they traditionally have GSS do is help out with that, have volunteers help with registration, be panel, discussion people, and then we'll have our mixer afterwards. 
Um, so, in, in which we really highly encourage you to invite faculty and other graduate students to get to know and mingle there. Um, but we're actively looking for people um, to be on the panel still, and we'd like to have people from a variety of backgrounds and disciplines who have had at least one semester completed at graduate school. So, yes? What's the actual date for that? October 12th. So it'll be a Wednesday, October 12th. The panels are all day? No, the, the panel is it's just, it's like usually 12, yeah. it's 12 to 1.30, yeah, and you'll have there. So, okay. Cool work. It'll be in the University Center, and then our mixer will go over to Davis Hall in the basement in the University Club. And last year it was seriously fun. Uh, uh, we had a great time. bigger every year from what I've heard. Yes, and however, we have a goal, and last year we did not have very many faculty come, although we tried really hard to bring our own faculty people. <laughs> and, and I did the best. I had two. Dr. Ferris was there, and so was Tim Moore, so I had two out of five. I think I I should have gotten a couple of cocktails out of that myself, if you want my personal opinion. But anyway, well, one of the things that um, we would like you to do is please, please, please invite your own faculty members, your directors, your committee members, whoever they are, and ask them to come. Um, we are actually working still on the budget. Last year we were able to offer a free drink with admission, like basically you came in, you got a cocktail which we used as a bargaining chip for <laughs> getting folks there. Our budget, unfortunately, has been cut, but I am I'm working with um, the graduate school to get them to kind of help support it and give us some moolah our way. And hopefully, fingers crossed, I will be able to at least offer a cocktail to the faculty member who comes. So that's our goal, is to at least be able to buy them a drink. So what, um, what would they be doing there? I mean, if I'm at, asking my faculty member to come, what they're going to go Thanks. So, <laughs> chat, hang out. So grad, grad fest is, um, as Rebecca said, recruiting tool for to bring in right. undergrads to the graduate programs here. So that's who they would be mixing with. Well, mostly, but I mean, in all honesty, it's mostly us who goes, and so like, it's mostly our own graduate students who go for that part. And um, last year, I mean, we had an amazing turnout. It was a whole room full of graduate students hanging out and drinking and eating food. Um, and a handful of staff and faculty, and I would like it to be more of that, you know. So it's an opportunity to, you know, a rare to have a social event with a faculty member. I mean, I can't, you know, maybe our department's different. We get a couple of those a year in English, but that's not really a whole lot, you know. I mean, I would welcome an opportunity to be able to just hang out with a faculty member in a more relaxed, relaxed setting, personally. So um, anyway, what I was getting at is, as soon as we have that part worked out about whether or not we'll be able to offer um, a complimentary beverage to our invited faculty members, I will let you know and we'll also put, have, we'll put together the official invite so that you can download it, print it, and hand deliver it to your faculty member and ask them to join you. So that would be awesome. Uh, hopefully we'll be in that soon. Yeah. Sometimes you know for our next meeting. Yeah, so look for it in emails for meeting next week, so hopefully panel they'll want to know it'll be basic stuff like how do you manage your time how different were the classes from undergraduate to graduate I was on it last year and it was really interesting it was um, they, last year we did it for the it had always been two separate panels of alumni one with alumni and one graduate students last year we combined it into one giant super panel and um, but it was really interesting and the graduates or the undergraduate students who were potential graduate students really we just wanted to know what graduate school was like, mostly, but all aspects of that. So I fielded questions about everything from, you know, how it might change your family life to uh, how you get through the day <laughs> as a graduate student to um, you know, what to expect from your professors. I mean, you name it. And there were four, yeah, four graduate students and four alumni members last year. I imagine they're doing. Yeah, we were trying to get a little bit of yeah. So, and it was fun. And so what we last year we had four definites and two alternates in case somebody had needed to drop out the last minute. Um, so we'll do the same thing. But yeah, let us know. There will be a form, right? Where you can let us know if you want to find out. So first come first. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, and one more thing. We got flyers again to pass up for our next meeting. So make sure people get them because our next meeting is free pizza. So close to the
professor sent me. So much you submit, two weeks before you travel, and we'll give you up to uh, $500 for percent and $750, that's like 1000 um, for research. Um, and I hope that was awesome. Yeah, go, please ask a question. You were supposed, were you supposed to attend at least uh, um, at least three activities and two meetings. Yes. Um, and, and of course, um, volunteering for GradFest will count as one of the activities. Um, volunteering as uh, one of the, being to be one of the committee members will also count as an activity. Um, and if you want to be the moderator for the website or the uh, Twitter page, that will also count as an activity. In yeah. terms of research, um, for example, if you're traveling um, to perform some research overseas or, or yes, well, to we gather information about something. Yes, well, we, we do have different amounts. I believe it's 750 uh, national and 1,000 uh, oh, broad. 1,000 or 1,250. I think it's broad. Of course, it will depend um, on where you're going. You know, if you're going to go to San Antonio, we'll give you less than if you're going to Wisconsin. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah. 